Uh, welcome to our 11th fireside chat. Today's questions are focused on focusing on intent, um, the fractal nature of consciousness, the politics of non-physical matter reality, virtual reality, dreams, and the physical matter reality rule set. We'll start with a question from our physicist in the group, Joe, on soul groups and the fractal nature of consciousness. Joe asks, consciousness appears to be fractal and exhibit or reflect a self-similar nature as individu individuated units of consciousness in PMR, which is physical matter reality, or MPMR, non-physical matter reality. Are we also part of larger soul groups that are also evolving the quality of consciousness as a larger individuated group or unit. Uh, during a return to physical matter reality, such as reincarnation, do we return as the previously evolved or devolved individuated unit of consciousness or a superposition of units from a larger consciousness group? Um. Well, there's, like, there's two ideas there that um, kind of mixing and mingling and maybe sometimes getting a little confused. Typically, we talk about soul groups. We talk about groups of souls who tend to incarnate together, interact with each other, and they do this for, uh, what do we say, good foils for each other, good straight men for each other. You know, they, they, they bring out... Uh, the challenges and things that, that the other people need. So they, they just make a good team. They work well together. Let's put it that way. They, tend, they can tend to bring out those challenges or, or help somebody uh, deal with challenges. So the people who have incarnated before, it worked really well between the two of them. They, they both grew a lot because of the interaction. So they decide, well, we seem to work well together. Let's do it. You know, let's do that again. And let's make it such that uh, we will meet and interact uh, in our next incarnation because it works so well this time. And sometimes you'll get three or four or five, maybe six, maybe larger groups that, that uh, have worked with each other. It's almost like they become uh, better, more effective teammates because they kind of know each other better and have, uh, have deeper uh, connections. So that happens, and that's typically what's meant by, by soul groups, that people do incarnate in, in groups, but they all have individual um, you know, souls, individual units of consciousness, and each one is responsible for their own growth. In other words, the other ones can't really pull the other one up along with them, or they don't get a uh, kind of a joint score, you know, like sometimes you're, you're in school and, and the school hands out a project to your team and the team works together and the team hands in one result and the team gets one grade so that everybody in that team gets the same grade. It's, it's the team grade and every individual gets it. Well, it's not like that. It's not a, you don't get a team grade. You, you always evolve or de-evolve based on your own choices. So the advantage in, in working with a group isn't that that group will somehow pull you along or, or, uh, or help you out in, in that way that you'll actually get more points. You'll, get a, you know, you'll, you'll go up a level even if you haven't really earned it because the whole team went up a level. No, that's not it. You still have to earn all of your uh, reduced entropy. All the quality of, of consciousness you get, you have to earn it through your own choices. So yes, there are such things as soul groups. Now, these are not people who are in it uh, you know, initially. This is, a, this is people who have been around and around and around enough that they've actually run into some friends that they've made that now they, that they have these teammates that work well together that they go back with. So it's not that everybody is in that kind of arrangement. Sometimes it's just maybe two. Sometimes, a lot of times, most of the times, it's just one, just the individual. But what I'm trying to say is that it's very unlikely that this happens to the beginners, to the people who are just uh, starting out, it's much more likely for the people who have been doing this a long time and have come a pretty long way, have a pretty good quality of consciousness, they're more likely to be in these, in these groups. But it is an individual thing. 
so it's it's um, it's still an you know, it's still up to the individual to make whatever gains they make or or don't make. It's not a it's not a group score. I guess that would be the you know the thing to say. Now, the larger consciousness system can provide kind of a oh I don't know a kind of a, a group experience with those individuated units of consciousness that are uh, of lesser capacity. Okay, if you have if we're talking about uh, you know bumblebees. Well, every bumblebee doesn't necessarily um, count or isn't necessarily working on their own personal um, uh, evolution. Now, maybe bumblebees are too high up the line. Maybe, all, maybe individual bumblebees are. Let's go down maybe a little lower level to things like, uh, you know, clams or something. Insects that uh, don't seem to be that individual. You can have groups of very um, low capacity units of consciousness working together as a, as a group. And the whole group then does kind of evolve together. Mostly, I guess, that would fall among, among uh, some, some of the insects that are uh, less individualistic. So you could have group souls in that sort of sense. But for um, even dogs and cats, much less people, there's enough individuality there that what you gain in, by your good choices is to your benefit, and everybody must do their own work. Tom, we have spoken about this subject before in an interview we did on, uh, with, on Brian Weiss's experiences. In one of his books, Miracles Happen, he points out a multiple incarnation. In other words, three people are one individuated unit of consciousness experiencing different aspects of PMR at the right. same time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's another one, aspect of it. Yes. If one of these beings on the earth dies, is that, is that individuated unit of consciousness part of then the two remaining, or is it part of now MPMR? Oh. Okay, now what Don is talking about is the situation uh, where you have a single individuated unit of consciousness that for its own uh, reasons of optimizing its learning will incarnate m to more than one um, being, one uh, physical body, if you will, one avatar. So it and it may set up relationships for itself. So it may it may incarnate as being one, as the father of being one, and of the son of being one. You see, so now you have a uh, a a, um, well, you might say a child, parent, grandparent, uh, all uh, from the same IUOC. Because the IOUC is only investing a fraction of itself, some portion of itself, into the free will awareness unit, which is the thing that basically is the experiencer of what the avatar is doing. That's the, that's the part of it that gets the data stream. So this free will awareness unit is a subset of the individuated unit of consciousness. And if the individuated unit of consciousness has enough capacity, it can support maybe two or maybe three free will awareness units, okay, which now all have the same IUOC, individuated unit of consciousness. So that's what Don is talking about. And that doesn't happen that often, but it does happen sometimes where the issues that they need to outgrow are relationship issues and by setting themselves up in a in a relationship to each other themselves all interacting and that can be very educational. So that's just an example. Now what Donna asked is that well what arise what happens? Well that that uh, free will awareness unit then is gone. And it was very nice. So it's the first 
Big Will Awareness Unit that was that that individual, one of the three. It just uh, you know uploads all the things that it's learned, you know, to its integrated unit of consciousness, and it uh, disappears. Free Will and Awareness Units blink in and blink out as they're as they're needed, and the other two continue on. So it's not like the one that leaves then goes back into the two that are there or anything. It, it all does go back to the IUOC, the individuated unit of consciousness, but they remain individual with their individual experiences and, and, and so on. It's just now there's just two of them to interact rather than three. So that's the way that works. But again, this is a rarer part of, of uh, you know, what happens. It's, it, it's less rare if to just have two and it's even less rare, of course, to have you know the basic, which is one. That's and again, that happens more with people who are more highly evolved their consciousness as opposed to those that are just beginning. Don't do those sorts of things so much. Does that answer your Tom, question, Donna? Yes, Tom. I I lost part of the answer. Part of the part of the audio was lost. Uh, but are you saying that the individuated unit of consciousness then? that one being returns to the individuated unit of consciousness in MPMR and the others continue to yes. experience their own, yes. uh, contribute to their own experience. Okay, that does answer. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from an MBT user, Dante, on the significance of taking part in a simulation. If one is playing a computer game simulation, the task of the game might be to build things or to develop your character's abilities, etc. But of course, nothing really happens because it is just a simulation. If really we and all possible consciousness systems that we, that were, are or ever could be, are simulations run by the uh, absolute unbounded oneness, AUO, then that which is accomplished in these simulations uh, for example, entropy lowering is only an illusion too, and nothing really happens either. Can you comment on this? Yeah, I'm not sure uh, why we're saying when you say is this an illusion too or illusion also. Um, I, I don't know why the the uh, author of that question you know said that, but no, it's not an illusion. The uh, the um, Amount of evolution, the amount of entropy, entropy reduction, an individuated unit of consciousness is able to achieve sticks with them. That's that's uh, cumulative. That's not um, uh, you know that does not evaporate. That does not start over because growth and and uh, evolution has to be a iterative process. You know, you don't have evolution on a one-shot basis. It's not like, well, here's everything. All right, we'll give everybody one chance to evolve. All right, time's up. That's it. You know, evolution doesn't work that way. Evolution is a is things where the output of today's you know evolution you know becomes the input you know that feeds the next one. So it's what you, what you are then evolves to become more, and then that that more that you are evolves to become yet more. So the output feeds back into the input. And it has to be an iterative process, which means it's it uh, the future depends on on the past in the sense that it's a it's a growing it's a growing process. So no, that is not uh, an illusion. Now maybe he's asking, is the larger consciousness system also um, <laughs> quote just data unquote? And the answer is yes. Of course, the whole system is an information system. The whole system is information. But don't think that because it's, quote, just data, unquote, means that it somehow isn't real or it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not fundamental. The larger consciousness system is an information system. It is, um, you know, a, uh, a system that is still evolving. And we... We individuated units of consciousness are subsets of that. We're pieces of that information. And we, too, are just data. We, too, are information. Okay, that defines us, our history, what we've done, our, our level 
that we have evolved the quality of our consciousness, all that's information. And that information defines us. And that's also probabilistic. It's not just a data set that is a fixed data set, but there's a lot of probability based in that. And uh, you know what we might do given any particular choice. And then we, in, we uh, have an incarnation, and they could probably put quotes around that too, quote, incarnation, quote. Um, I call it an experience packet. We go have an experience packet in a, a digital uh, VR simulator so that we can better make these choices in a situation where we have immediate feedback. That's what the rule set gets us. So the fact that something is, is, um, is information-based, that it's virtual, doesn't mean that it is somehow fake or an illusion, you see? So we have, you know, we have a virtual reality that, surpri that su supplies us with avatars. Okay, now the virtual, the virtual reality is where our body is, and our body's the avatar. The consciousness that's playing that body cannot be in the same reality frame as the body. Okay, so we play World of Warcraft. We, as the player, we're in the same reality as the server for World of Warcraft. The the world of world of the World of Warcraft, you know, that that map, that reality where the elf you know, lives and plays, that can't be in the same reality as the server. You see, it's just logically impossible. So the virtual reality, a simulation, you know, cannot simulate itself. It has to be simulated from outside of itself, outside in another reality frame. So the World of Warcraft frame is a different frame than the frame that the server has to be in. Well, it's the same with us. Here we are, we're playing in this virtual reality, but our consciousness can't be a part of this virtual reality. Our consciousness is in a, another reality frame. It's just playing this character. So we have to get that same concept. So we tend to think of it as, oh, you know, our virtual reality, our physical reality, our physical universe, that's just the fake illusion. Well, that's not really true. It's, you know, I guess we say the world of Warcraft is a fake illusion. But if you back up and say, well, what about consciousness? Consciousness is also information. Okay. It's also, but it's information that makes choices. It's information that is aware, information that is evolving. The avatar that's in the physical reality frame, that is not something that is alive, evolving, and, and uh, works on its own. It only seems to do that. We are the consciousness that fuel it. So it's just like the elf body. You see, the elf body is, quote, just information. It's just the body. It interacts. It, it makes choices for the player. The player can then play those choices out. The player gets to make the choice. Do I run? Do I fight? So that's a player's choice. That's the choice of the consciousness. And then the body acts it out. And in acting it out, it interacts with others and creates more choices. You see? So that's, the, that's what the virtual reality does. It creates choices and feedback. But the consciousness itself is information, but a different kind of information. It's, information, it's a set of information that's evolving. It's changing. It's self-aware. And then the larger conscious system is yet another information system. So don't equate the the you know the fake, the not real, the illusion with being data. All of it's data. It's all information. All the reality we can know is quote just data. It's all information. But some information sets are different than others. Some being chips off the old block off the uh, larger consciousness system are in themselves have awareness and, and a choice and free will. Other data sets like the avatars we're in are just computed um, games for us to experience in. So there's different levels of, of um, information systems. Maybe that will, will uh, answer that, that question. But I have a lot of people get hung up on the, what do you mean it's just data? 
you know, somehow they feel that themselves and their consciousness is somehow more or better than just data. And they, they get this idea that the just data is, is the fake stuff, but that's not true. It's all data. Everything's data, and, and just data can be a very significant thing. You know, the, the information can, can make a, a being with choice, awareness, and free will, and that's still just data. So hopefully that'll clear it up a little bit. I think it does, and we're going to talk more about this later, this data that you speak of in terms of how intuitives get this data, how they feel this evolving information is to them emotional, it's real. Uh, a while back at one of the workshops, someone asked you what your equation would be. Einstein's is uh, E equals MC square, and you gave not an equation so much as an identity, but R equals I, reality equals information. Um, I think the difficult part for some people, the word data seems scientific, but everything is such. As you just said, this evolving information is, is real, and we have to learn how to bridge that gap uh, with the, the language that we use. And yeah. you've, Language you've is a that. very difficult thing. Language is a, you know, the words we use and how we use them. Uh, a lot of people and I do it myself, uh, interchange word data and information. Okay, we have data and we have information. Uh, information systems, data systems, that uh, doesn't really make any difference. All means the same thing, but you know, if we're really being, being precise about it, then there is a differentiation there. The data, the, the ones and zeros, if you will, the information is, what do all those ones and zeros mean? How do I interpret those? And that requires the consciousness. So consciousness, um, creates the information by taking the data and processing it by their own experience, by their own quality, um, by their own fears and, and love and whatever, and interpreting it. They interpret the data into information. Then they have certain information they want to send. Well, they have to take that, that information, which is an understanding, and, and code that out as data. And once they created, you know, once they've uh, coded their information into data, now they can send the data to somebody else. You see, so there's two different slants to this information data thing. Information's the meaning, the content, and data the ones and zeros. So that's kind of the precise split between those. But mostly people don't speak and think that way. Mostly people think data information all kind of the same thing, you know, we talk about it generally. So I thought I'd maybe make that specific. So if we are getting into a conversation where it, it matters to make a difference between those two, then that's the, that's the difference. Okay, Tom, the next questions are on properly set intent, focused intent, um, and they come from Josh. Polly, Shaw, and Lawrence. I'll start with um, Josh's question first, and perhaps they will all um, get an answer. I think previously you said that one aspect or piece of setting a good intent was to stay emotionally neutral and not to be too invested in the outcome so that it can't creep in. I've looked in my past experiences when I believe I've set an intent successfully and noticed a sort of stoic emotional tone during both the setting of intent and any time I reset it later on. In those cases, I obviously wanted the outcome that I was setting my intent for, but I had to actively keep the emotions in check. Is, is this what you mean? That's the first part of his question. It, I would uh, use the word detached and say you need to be detached uh, when you are interacting uh, with the larger consciousness system. And what I mean when I say detached, I mean you need to detach what you're doing, your intent, from your ego. That's really what I mean by being detached. You need to detach it from your ego, from your fear. Okay, that's the problem. If, it's a, if you have an ego, fear, belief attached to your intent, that tends to weaken your intent, and it um, 
you won't be nearly as successful. So if you what you're trying to do is heal someone, then you have to not be attached to the outcome. You have to not be attached to, oh, I really want it. It needs to be this way. This is the way it has to be. You know, if it's if it's any different than that, it would be terrible. If you have all these needs and wants and ego attachments to the result, then you'll be much weaker in your in focusing your intent. But if you just have a strong intent to accomplish something, yet you will, you know, and you accept whatever the outcome is, is whatever the outcome is. You're just going to put all of your intent into doing it, you see. So now you're, you've given up control. You're not trying to control things. It's not like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm in charge now. I'm going to control the world. I'm going to control the health of this person. If you go into it from a point of control, then that's your ego speaking. If you go into it as an act of caring or an act of love, I'm going to do this because I want to do this. I think it's a good thing to do. And then you just do it. Then that's different uh, than having a, a uh, kind of a, an egoic uh, component to your intent. So that's really what I meant when I was making that differentiation. You have to be um, kind of a, an independent from the object that you're working on, which is maybe somebody's health. Now, people find the very same thing here in this reality. That's why a surgeon doesn't operate on their own children, on their own wife or their own brother. If, if, if a surgeon, if a heart surgeon has a child with heart problems, that surgeon finds another surgeon that they trust to do that work. They don't do it themselves. Why? Because they have you know, an attachment to the outcome. And they have enough of attachment to the outcome that it will get in the way with them doing the work. You see, they won't be objective. They will be um, more, they have fear attached to what they're doing, which will block them and get in the way of the possibilities, where someone who can be detached from that can just do what's best for that patient and make quick decisions, then they're a better doctor than the one who is wadded up with expectations and needs, and they can't make those quick decisions because it's just, they have too much, you know, invested in the outcome to to do to do it with detachment. It's the same thing. It's a it's a very similar kind of thing. The ego gets in the way. The fear gets in the way of you being your best, and that'll happen in this reality as well as the larger reality. Secondly, uh, Josh asks, is there any other feedback other than a successful result? which may or may not have been due to the intent that we can be aware of. I'm more thinking about a feeling, not an emotional feeling, or some other form of information that we can be aware of during the setting of the intent to know if we are not just doing it right, but doing it in a more powerful way than emotionally charged wishful thinking. Yes, there is. As you practice, uh, you get better at that feeling that he that he mentions. When you initially start, uh, say, healing, healing is a good example as any. When you initially start healing, you're probably not real good at it and not real powerful with it, although you probably do get better. People, even if you're not very good at it, you know, it's not like you have to be a master before you get any results. You'll get some results. And you probably have a, a you know a probability uh, of maybe one in you know four or one in three that what you're doing is, is is random, which means it's not random unless you know well let's put it this way you know if if you if you do it a hundred times and exactly fifty percent of the times it works the way you are working it to work and the other fifty percent it doesn't well that's called random see that might happen anyway because take somebody's health and you can say well they might get better they might get worse and if you have no idea how their disease is or anything about it then there's about a fifty fifty chance perhaps that uh, you know that could happen so but if you heal a hundred people 
and you know 90 of them get better immediately afterwards, well, what's the probability of that just being good luck? So that's like flipping 100 coins and 90 of them all come up heads. Well, that's pretty unlikely to happen just on chance, you see. So that feeling as you practice and your, pro and your probability of success goes up, you do get a sense of when it's right, when you've, when you've been effective. And uh, that is usually pretty accurate. Not always accurate, though, but usually pretty accurate. At least I've noticed that. Now, I've probably done these things thousands, probably many thousands of times. And I have a, I have a good sense of when I'm really connecting and, and uh, you know, can put some power onto the problem and when I'm really not. That's, it gets more and more obvious with time as uh, you know what's working and sometimes you just need to let it go and come back to it later because you're just not uh, you're not tied to it but then I have had other times when I spent very little time on it you know it was uh, a request was made to help out with something and I was very busy and oh I thought about it uh, sometime later maybe the next day and I spent maybe 10 seconds on it just kind of went there and said da -da -da, okay help and then I forgot about it and got consumed in other things. And then I'll see that person, I, uh, you know, two or three weeks later, and they go, "Thanks, everything really changed. You know, uh, I got better right away, and this happened and that happened." And I'm thinking, "Did I do that or not? I really didn't put that much effort into it." And I've done that enough times to realize that sometimes I'm a lot more effective than I think I am. So you're you're thinking about this. You know, how do you know? Well, I, sometimes I get surprised, too. I don't know. I think I've done something that's maybe not effective. Maybe that was just good luck on that case. But it's happened enough times that I'm thinking that sometimes you can be very effective when, you, when you're not even, you, know, you don't necessarily feel like it. So, yeah, I do get a feeling that, yeah, this is good. I've made a good connection there. I feel good about that. And sometimes I have a feeling like, well, I really haven't done much. But it doesn't always work out that way. So uh, uh, mine, mine anyway, isn't at 100%. I'm probably batting around 80 or 90% as far as whether that feeling is correct or not. And I think the, the difference is, is that some people really don't need much to get that snowball rolling. In other words, all you have to do is give them a, you know, a nudge at the right time in the right direction and after that, that snowball just rolls down the hill and, and does really fine. Whereas other people need a lot of energy put into them. They need a lot of work to make a difference because you have so far to go. And I think that's kind of it. So sometimes when you felt like, well, it didn't do much, well, it didn't take much. You know, and uh, other times when you work very hard and you don't get much of a result, well, Sometimes it's just very difficult and takes a whole lot of energy to modify what's going on. So that's the thing. So even though you feel like, yeah, that I had a good connection, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a quick result. It depends on how much energy what you're trying to do is going to require. In other words, how far are you trying to move the probability and how much other intent is working against you, trying to make it go the other way. You see, so in that case, you may really connect and really work long and hard and not get much of a result. So the, the, the idea of, of the feeling that you've made a good connection or that you've, you've not done much is not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation with the result, I guess is, is uh, what I'm trying to tell you. But yes, there is such a feeling, but it, it may or may not predict the result. I hope that answered the question for you, Josh. And thanks for filling that in. Uh, Tom, when you say, when you use the word energy in this instance, I know this is a very, very often asked question, this focusing of intent, especially for healing. Um, do you mean how well you can fine tune your focus, how clear you can get your mind, how much you can maintain that? Yes, that's really the source of the energy is this focus and, and the, the clarity of your intent. I use the word energy as a metaphor, and really that's what energy is. Energy in, the, in a virtual reality 
you know, it's it's a metaphor for an ability to, to change something. That's how energy's defined. That's the kind of the metaphor that energy is. Words are metaphors for things. So if you have energy, if you can bring energy energy to bear, then that means you've you've been able to change something. If you can't change anything, then it's like, well, there wasn't any energy, you know. So energy means a kind of a, a force, a, a thing that can cause changes. That's how, you know, that's kind of the metaphor. So I use it that way. But no, I'm not really sending some kind of physical substance, some kind of energy to that person that they're using. I'm modifying the probabilities of the future to make it, an outcome happen. I'm not... Uh, um, you know, it's not the physical sense of sending sending energy like you you know you beam down energy that then that person uses. That's the image, perhaps. That's the metaphor. But what's happening is intent is modifying future probability. That's the actual happening. And the metaphor helps you focus on what it is you want to do. So you you work in terms of energy, like putting white energy on a black illness. You see, such that the white energy overcomes the black. And you think of that in terms of the metaphor of energy because that's kind of the way we think and that makes sense to us. But what's actually happening is you're modifying future probability. Tom, technically we all have this ability. I think some people might underestimate their ability to do these things. But there's also the question of does it have to do with our quality of being, how well we can focus this, this energy? Yes, uh, yes to both of those. Uh, everybody has can have it. You know, everybody has an intent. Now, many of us are not in control of that intent, and it's just kind of haphazard, and it just happens. However, it happens to bubble out of us at any particular time, and it might change every three or four seconds because our mind flips around from thing to thing. Uh, but everybody can create an intent, and intent does modify probability. So this ability to heal or change uh, future probability uh, around the, the health of someone uh, is, you know, is, is available to everyone with a consciousness. You know, your dog and cat has consciousness and intent too. They also can use their intent to heal and modify probability. It's just the nature of consciousness. So it's, it's not something you have to go to school to learn uh, or take a training course to learn. Everybody has it, but everybody doesn't focus it as well, everybody does, can't keep their intent uh, kind of stationary on one thing for very long. Uh, when most people first learn to meditate, they're told to just empty their mind of all thoughts. And the average person can do that for about three seconds. And then the thoughts start just coming in all by themselves. And then they'll say, oh, I've got to get rid of those thoughts. Well, another three seconds. The thoughts are all coming in. You see, their intent is jumping around. Their intent was to do this. And three seconds later, they're not doing that anymore. You see, that's gone. They're doing something else. They're processing other kinds of things, and that's what those thoughts are. And they have a hard time holding their intent still and focused for more than just a few seconds. So most of us are walking around with our intent being, you know, it's like a you know, garden hose that's on the spray setting to where it's just going out all over, you see. So it, it creates very little pressure and very little force that way because it's spraying out in 360 degrees, you know, all around, you know, over the whole sphere. So it's just this, it's kind of a light mist everywhere and doesn't really have a lot of good. But if you can focus all that down to just one heavy stream of water, one beam, you see, that's very narrow, now you got something that can, that can move things. You know, now you got something that can, uh, you know, is powerful. You know, now you've got a pressure washer, right, that can really uh, do something important as far as moving and changing things, whereas a, a nice little fuzzy mist of water you know, going in all directions just doesn't have a lot of power behind it. So it's, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about focusing intent. You have to be able to make your intent strong and clear and hold it steady for you know, long periods of time. And by that, what do I mean? Well, you know, depends on what you're working on. But I'd say, uh, you know, if you work it up to a whole minute or two, then you probably can see some good results in, uh, in healing. But what I mean by long time is like a half an hour, an hour, two hours. 
you ought to be able to hold that intent and focus it for you know, an hour or two, whenever you want to, however you want to. And then you ought to be able to par parallel process. So our analogy with the garden hose would be that you have two very fine beams of water coming out with a lot of force rather than just one. So you can hold two intents constantly and with good focus, or three intents. And generally, at least from my experience, you know, two, three, and four get progressively harder. Five is like the upper limit for me. Now, maybe there are people who do more than that, but you get too many intents at once, and uh, the thing starts to dissipate. And that's just a matter of practice. You could probably go to, you know, ten or more if you, uh, you know, practiced it and had the discipline. It's not that you can't do more. It's just that you generally don't do any more than what you need, and then you're, that's what you practice. So yes, that's the idea with intent. It's to focus your, your intention on a single thing and hold that focus. That's what, that's what has power. And the higher quality you are, which is to get the other half of your question, the more focus you get, you know, the tighter that is, the stronger your intent. And that's because if you're low quality, that means you have more fear. Fear is what is is a um, you know we have we have love and fear dichotomy, and fear is a high entropy. That means it disintegrates things, it tears apart, it divides. It's constantly uh, uh, defocusing, if you will. Fear is a defocusing. Uh, a defocusing what, uh, uh, I don't know, function is what fear does, and love is a focusing function. So as you grow up and become more love and less fear, then you can focus that intent much better. So yes, it is, it is uh, connected to, to quality, which is another point that I should make. Many people want to do phenomena. You know, I want to go out of body. I want to heal. I want to do all these things. And they try, and they're not too successful at it, and it's because what they should be doing is working on the quality of their consciousness, you see? Because until you have built up that quality of consciousness, then these things are very hard to do. They're problematic. You know, you, you can't, you can maybe go out of body if you work on it real hard, but you can't do it when you want to, how you want to. You don't have much control over it. That's because you haven't yet developed the quality of consciousness to where, you know, that becomes much easier. So it would be like, uh, well, I want to be a concert pianist, you know? So I'm going to go get a piano, and now don't bother with lessons. I'm just going to put my hands on the keys and play something beautiful. Oh, listen to all that sound. Isn't that great? You say, well, it's okay. You're making sound, but it's no, it's not really all that great. You're not too focused yet. It's mostly random, you see. And so people who get really excited about playing the piano, they, they run out and buy a piano, and, and then they get real disappointed because it doesn't sound like much. It just sounds like a jumble. Oh, uh, I guess I just can't play the piano. Well, no, you're getting the cart in front of the horse is the problem. First, you need to work on raising your quality of consciousness. You need to get rid of the fear and anxiety and stress and beliefs that make it very difficult for you to focus your intent well. So that's, that's kind of a, a, an issue that many people are, are very much attracted to the phenomena, the healing, the out-of-body, the remote viewing. And they want to do that, but when you say, well, what you really need to do is become love first, they go, yeah, 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 I don't have time for that. I want to go out of body. And that's a, that's a cart in front of the horse problem that uh, usually doesn't work well. Well, you can still get there. It just takes longer that way. I think that was an interesting analogy, the piano. Uh, when you were speaking of that, I thought... We have some artists here and musicians here. Would a, accomplishing a task such as um, learning a complicated piano piece help you focus better? Help you accomplish focusing your mind better, such as perhaps even painting a picture or writing something? Sure, those, those things help because they help you develop. You know, they're like um, you know exercises for your intent and your focus. Um, you know, I'd say mathematics. And, uh, 
and focus. You're not going to be a really good guitar player or saxophone player or a musician or anything else if you can't really focus. You're not even going to be good playing video games. You know, you're not going to be your elf and go do well if you can't focus. If your mind's all over the place and can't really pay attention to what's happening and get into it, then you're not going to do it very well. But there's another point here, too, is that when you do those things well, you probably are not doing them with your intellect. You learned, and, and here's, a, here's an example, when you learn to type, when you first start typing, you're thinking, ah, the T key, you know, left hand up and to the right, there's the T, oh, the E's next to that. And every time you see a letter that you type, you have to intellectually think, which finger is supposed to hit that on what row? And it's an intellectual process. And at that intellectual process, if you practice that a whole lot, you may get up to 15, 20 words, you know, a minute. But if you let go of the intellect and let do it enough that those fingers just go where they go, and it's not that your intellect is saying, oh, take this finger and move it up and to the right. The finger just knows because you look at the letter on the page and you see that T, and it just knows that that index finger goes up to the right without your intellect getting involved. And when you play a piano, it's the same way. When you're playing that piano, you don't say, uh-oh, Pinky has to move three keys down and over to the right. You know, that doesn't work. If you played the piano that way, you'd be stuck with Mary Had a Little Lamb. That's about as far as you'd get. If you really want to be good at any of these things, including playing video games or anything else, you need to get past the part where you're in control, where you have to focus with your intellect. You have to get to the part where it's just natural. You do it because you're, you will it. And as you will it, it happens. You see, you just know where to go. Now, a, a, a musician that plays by ear can listen to somebody play a, a melody or a piece, and they can just sit down and without thinking about anything, uh, not where, you know, maybe they'll think about, well, what key do I start in? But they'll just take that melody, they'll put their hands on the keys, and psh, there it is. They duplicate it. It has nothing to do with their intellect. It has everything to do with how many hours they've sat, you know, in front of that keyboard trying to do that. That's what it has to do with. So you have to get good at something. You have to get past the intellect. And if it's true with your healing and it, you know, with your remote viewing and the rest of that. It's all the same way. You have, you first, when you learn, you're using your intellect. Oh, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to quiet my mind. Now I need to go out and this. But as long as your intellect's in charge, you'll only be but so good. You get to the point that it just happens because it's a natural part of your process. Now your will is obeyed and, you know, type the lazy brown fox jumped over, the, no, it's a something brown fox, jumped over the lazy brown dog, I guess. You know, that little typing thing. You know, you don't have to think about that. Your, your fingers just beat it out. Now you can do 60 words a minute instead of 15 because you've told your intellect to go sit down and be quiet while you do this. So it's the, it's the same with mental things. It's the same with spiritual things as well. You've got to get your intellect out of the picture because with your intellect also comes your fear your ego, and all sorts of other divisive and high entropy things that just, you know, get in the way. And it's not a, it, it's, it can't be a controlled intellectual process to be really effective. Your intellect's too slow and not all that smart. Thank you, Tom. I think that illustrated that point very well. Uh, we'll go on to Polly's next question that was overlooked last time. This is also to do with the same theme of intent. Um, he's searching for a formulation of intent that would help him grow. Um, at first, I thought it, I needed to be there for others to help everywhere and anywhere where it's needed. This was unfortunately fueled by the fears disguised as desires to prove myself to someone and to see myself as good or capable. Then I realized I was not being authentic. I'm acting as if I was someone who I want to be, but I'm not there yet. And internal pressure was growing. It was clear from the outside that I'm not doing things out of an inner balance. So what shall I be? Authentic, helpful to others, 
being constantly connected to MPMR, being truly empathetic. What uh, would you comment on this? Okay, well, that's really a good time to ask this question because it falls right in what we've been talking about. So Pauli's problem is his intellect is in control. It's not, it's, he's not just doing and being. He's, he's doing and being what he thinks he ought to do and be. His intellect is running the game, you see. And that's the difference between intellectual level and the being level. As long as your intellect's in charge, trying to orchestrate the process, then the process is just never going to work. You know, you're just never going to type very well as long as you have to think about which key to hit with which finger when. So the intellect gets in the way. The intellect has you doing things that are you're, you're now creating an image. If somebody looked at you, they'd say, oh, what a kind, generous, and helpful person that Polly is because all the time I see him, he's helping other people, he's such a sweet guy, and da-da-da-da-da. But if inside, you're doing all that just because you think that's what you ought to be doing, well, it's more civilizing. <laughs> Everybody around you appreciates it. You're a nicer guy and have more friends, but you haven't really grown much. You see, you don't grow up with that. So the problem is the intellect. Now, why do people use their intellect uh, instead of just being? Mostly it's because of fear. What they think is that Everything will be fine as long as I can control it. But if I let it go out of control, if I just let it go and just be who I am, geez, I don't know what will happen. It could be really ugly. You know, it might not be nice at all. You know, I may bark at everybody, bite a few people, you know, grab all the money on the floor and run. You know, maybe that's what I am inside. I don't know, and I can't risk that. Therefore, I need to be in control. I need to do these things, follow this prescription, and make it keep that control on everything. You have to have enough courage to be authentic, to just be how you are, without the intellect telling you how you should be. Just be it. That doesn't mean that you're going to like it, but at least that starts you from square one is what you are. So if you just be it, and then you say, oh, well, see, I'm not nearly as nice a person as I've been acting or whatever. I've got all, I've got all this, uh, you know, I've got guilt. You know, I envy other people. I wish that guy would, you know, fall off a, you know, a cliff because he's in my way of getting a promotion. You know, you have all these things that come out because that's the real you. Well, that's then the place to start to grow up and to change that. Find the fear. Get rid of the fear. Not decide what would be a better behavior and then force yourself to act that way. You see, that's the intellect. So the, the solution to the problem is that it has to be on the being level. And working at the being level is the same as typing without thinking about it or playing a piano without thinking about where your fingers are. You see, that's at the point where it's just you. It's just natural. You're not thinking about it anymore. You've gotten out of the intellectual part, and you've just become it. And the reason you do what you do, the reason you're helpful, is because you're just a helpful person. That's the way you are, not because you think you should be helpful, and that's what you do. So it's a matter of being, not a matter of doing. And uh, how to how to help you get there? I don't, you know, that's that's a tough one because um, people who particularly are left brain dominant, who live their life out of their intellect, they have come to trust that intellect in all things, and they feel that if they don't let the intellect be in control, it's the result is liable to be scary. They allow it to go someplace they don't want to go. They don't trust that non-intellect. They don't trust that intuition. They don't trust those feelings because they can't control them. Those feelings and those things just happen. They just you know, kind of piss, you know, spill out of you. And uh, that's scary because there's no control. So it's the fear of not being in control. It's the fear of not doing it right. It's the fear of doing things badly. It's the fear of not being as grown as you think you are. And that is what keeps your intellect in charge. So it's basically a fear thing at the, at the bottom. And you have to say, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? All right, I'll just be. I'll just find my, my authentic self and just be it. What's the worst thing that could happen? And you can say, well, I could turn out to be a real jerk. You know, I could turn out to be very self-centered and self-focused if I did that. 
I could turn out, you know, my friends wouldn't like me anymore. I'd be uh, annoying to people because that might be the way I am. I don't know. I've never been, I've never been who I am. <laughs> you know, I don't know, you know, and the unknown is scary all by itself. Well, you have to then accept that and say, well, okay, if that's the way it is, if I'm going to, uh, you know, if I end up being a jerk because I'm, I'm uh, authentic, I'm, a, I'm an authentic jerk, then accept that. Say, okay, I'll be that, but then I'll change it. I'll grow up. I'll find out why that is, and I'll find that fear, and I can deal with it. But I can't find that fear and deal with it if my intellect refuses to acknowledge that it's even there. You see, that's what your intellect does. It's basically saying that none of those things are there. So your intellect's in control. Now, all right, the fact that you're a jerk inside, well, that doesn't show. It's not there. You, de you're in, you, know, you deny that that's the case because you can control that such that it's not the case. Well, that's the scary part. You just have to have the courage to say, well, if that's it, that's, I'll be that. But if I'm going to be that, I'll notice it, and I can start to grow from there. Because that's square one where you have to start to grow. As long as you're wadded up in the intellect, all you're going to do is convince yourself that you are a certain way because you're creating an image, you're believing in the image, and then you're looking at that image and saying, that's me. And then what happens, you've done that, and you say, well, that's not really true. <laughs> you know, That's just my image, and that's your problem. You know, you've seen it, and you say, oh, I'm Mr. Nice Guy, and this and that, and then you look at it and say, well, you know, that's not actually true. I feel anger. I feel, you know, left out. I feel this and that. And if I really was just didn't have that ego, I wouldn't feel those things. So then you force yourself not to, not to, uh, um, not to feel those things. In other words, to ignore them. Well, it's not like those feelings go away. You just push them further down to where they're no longer at your conscious level. You see, now they're in the subconscious, and there's so many people walking around the planet who feel like their subconscious is kind of this ugly beast that comes out every once in a while, you know, and there's them, the good guy, and then there's the subconscious that makes them do all these crazy things. <laughs> the fact is, you know, there really is no such thing as a subconscious. That's just, it's a dysfunctional part of consciousness that's hiding the stuff that it's afraid of. So, uh, you know, there is no real... Uh, um, you know, there is no real good technique for telling or for showing you how to let go of technique. It's pretty much you just have to have the courage to be, see what that is, and then address it at the root. Find the fear and fix the fear. And when the fear's gone, the problem's gone. But until you fix that fear, then the problem's still there. You've just got to cover it over. And the problem is that if you cover all those fears over to the point that, no, that you can't see them anymore, then how are you ever going to get rid of any of them? You're stuck. You can't go forward. So that's the rock and the hard place that people are in you know, to get their growth going. They can't, uh, they can't really do it unless they have the courage to be whoever they are and let that control go. But you don't have to let it all go at once. You just let it go a little bit. You know, something, find a fear, get rid of the fear, just work your fears down one at, a, one at a time. But if you're not getting rid of fear, then you're not really accomplishing anything. So I don't know. I haven't really told you what you wanted to know. Your, your intellect would like a nice recipe that if you follow the recipe at the end, you come out and, you know, everything's just great. You're all grown up and uh, have a high quality of consciousness, but it doesn't, it's not an intellectual process that's in control. It's an internal being process that just is. So there's no real prescription for doing that. It's just something you have to do. Part of his other question, which I think you've touched on in just the previous answer, uh, does becoming love mean being your authentic self? Does that and does that lower entropy without really needing or intending to do that? Yes, because as you become love, that means letting go of fear. It's the fear that is being hidden. It's the fear that you uh, don't want to deal with. Is why you have your intellect in control, so you don't have to deal with that fear. If you get rid of the fear and you become love, then you are an authentic person. And by definition, you've gotten rid of the fear, so there is no... Uh, 
you know, there's nothing you're trying to cover up or use your intellect to control so that you don't, you know, get into that problem. You're not having to control yourself. It's it's not an intellectual process. Becoming love is just you're just being who you are, and you're that way because you're that way. It's totally not in intellectual. That doesn't mean that you can't think. Okay, this intellectual and thinking thing is sometimes a, a problem that trips people up, and you say, well. You know, you have to let the intellect get out of the way and just be. And people think, well, how can I do that? I am my intellect. I mean, that's who I am. You know, I, I, uh, I exist as an operative intellect. How can I let that get out of the way? If I got out of the way, I wouldn't be able to think. I'd just be a lump of putty. You know, I wouldn't uh, have any thoughts because thoughts are my intellect. That's not true. When you get rid of your fears, you still... Now, have an intellectual component. You still think. But that thinking, that awareness, is no longer in the service of fear. Ego is defined as awareness in the service of fear. So when you get rid of the fear, you get rid of the ego, and now you have intellect in the service of love. That's fine, because that intellect doesn't want to control. That intellect isn't fearful. That intellect isn't trying to hide anything, isn't trying to create images, isn't trying to be something other than it is, you see? It's all the fear that does that. So once you get rid of the fear, once you evolve that quality of your consciousness and uh, move toward becoming love, all that just takes care of itself. See? You're getting rid of the fear, so you have a higher quality and you are authentic. Because there is, it's the fear that makes you non-authentic. Uh, Pally would like me to share with you um, a quote that you gave on intent. Uh, my intention is to simply do the best I can to make choices that will lower the entropy of myself and others, to deal with whatever comes my way productively, to be part of the solution rather than be part of the problem. And he wanted you to comment on that. Yep. You know, those are things called affirmations. You know, little things like that that you can say that are very positive. Um, if it's just an intellectual recital, it has not much effect. If it's something you really feel at the being level, yes. What that does is remind you to be more that way. You know, it's like, uh, it's, it's like keeping the goal in mind of where you're going and what it is you need to do. So in as much as you, you, um, you read that or you say that and you mean it deeply, it will help you move in that direction. Affirmations can be very valuable. In as much as it's just part of your image, oh, every day I get up and read my information 25 times, my affirmation 25 times, aren't I a good guy? No, it's not helping you at all. It's just back to the intellect. So you take it in at a deeper level, and yes, those kinds of things can be, can be helpful things because what it does is it keeps you pointed in the right direction. And you'll notice some morning you'll get up and you'll say that affirmation, and right away will come to mind something you did the previous day that really didn't live up to that affirmation. See? And if you go, if you take that and you say, well, that's okay, I'll say my affirmation anyway, and we'll just go on. You see, then you haven't gained anything. But when you get that sense of, ah, I'm not really living this to, as much as I want to, then you have to not let that go. You have to say, why not? Where's the fear? What is it that's making it difficult for me to be this way? Then work that back to the fear and get rid of that particular fear. That may be a year's worth of work to get rid of that fear. It may not be quick. But get rid of it. And once it's gone, it's gone. And now you you have a higher quality of consciousness and everything else will be easier. Every time you get rid of a fear, getting rid of the next one is easier. The hardest one you'll get rid of is the first one. So don't uh, try to get rid of them all together because the more you grow up, the easier it is to grow up more. Perfect. Thank you very much for the answer. It's, it's excellent. I just wanted to share maybe one... Um, one idea I got this weekend on a workshop regarding the fear, overcoming fear uh, with a very strong uh, intellect in, well, as, as, a, as a wall that prevents me from it. Um, 
I was uh, given the advice to just be with that fear, just basically risk it, to feel it, uh, and to try to stick with the uh, bad feeling, so to speak, as long as I can. And uh, with time, I, it will somehow trickle into my core that it didn't kill me. I overcame that uh, bad feeling, and uh, basically, it will be easier and easier. So that was one recommendation that was given to me. That's a good recommendation. If you uh, you know if you apply that that well, I say the same thing. I give the same recommendations, but in little different words. I say first, when you find a fear, you have to own it rather than deny it. You have to accept it and say, yeah, that's me. That's my fear. Yeah, that's how I am deep down inside. I own it. Okay, because that's the first step. Because what most most people do when they see a part of themselves that hits them like, oh, that's not so good. They deny it. They ignore it. They say, yeah, well, but you know, I got other things that are good. And then they go on and just forget about it. In other words, they refuse to deal with it. So the first step is to own it and say, that's mine. That's, that's my fear. The, the second thing, and of course, as you, as you own it, you have to kind of follow it to, to its roots. You know, what is that root fear? Because even though it comes out at this level, the roots may go to something different. So you follow the roots back to just what it is, which is kind of what your advice said. Stay with it long enough. Eventually, you kind of drift down to the, to the crux of it, to the roots of it. And the other thing is that then to get rid of it, it's, you have to have this attitude, well, all right, fear, give me, your word, you know, give me your best shot. I'll accept it. I'll accept whatever this fear does to me. Because as soon as you accept the fear, all right, if I, if I don't uh, use my intellect, nobody will like me. You know, I'll be sullen, I'll withdraw, I'll do all these kinds of things because I'm an introvert and if I don't push myself and so on, and you say, well, okay, I accept that. I'm going to be authentic and be who I am and if, if never, all my friends go away and won't talk to me anymore, I'll accept that. That'll be all right with me. I'll make new friends, you know, new places, or maybe they weren't such good friends anyway, and you know, I'll deal with that. Well, once you accept it, you've just pulled the, the teeth out of the fear. What can the fear do to you now if you've accepted the worst thing that it can do to you? See, now there's no more reason to be afraid of it. If you can accept the very worst, then the, the fear no longer has teeth. It can't frighten you. You just go forward. And what you find out, what is found out 99.99% .99 of the time is the fear is nothing more than smoke. There's nothing really there. It's just a belief. And once you get, let it, once you accept it and let it and, and agree that okay, if that's it, I'll accept that that terrible thing. No terrible thing happens. But now you've faced it, you've let it be. Now you're authentic, at least in that one fear's concern, and you realize that nothing bad happened at all. I just had a belief that something bad might happen. I just had a fear and you can be afraid of the fear you see so fears can run in layers but yeah good advice I would give the same advice as different words the next question on focused intent comes from Lawrence um, in one of Tom's YouTube videos he explains how someone used their mind or focused intent to change the pH level of water how was this achieved does looking or staring at the water with focused intent have something to do with changing the pH level in a physical way, or is it just moving around the probabilities or modifying the probabilities that were already there on paper within the natural uncertainty of what the pH level was previously? Okay, good question, Lawrence. Um, the way that the way it works is that the intent, the the pH of water, and you can actually see this experiment done on YouTube. Um, I don't know, maybe Donna or somebody at the forum can help you come up with it. I, I can't tell you what, it, what the thing is, but it's a YouTube experiment. And uh, is it uh, Edward Teller? Is that the right one that was doing that, Donna? One of the actually physicist types who is kind of into uh, larger reality. Uh, is that, is that William, William Teller or um, Professor Emoto? I don't well, know. I think, Bill, I Bill think it might have been Teller who was doing that. But anyway, it's, it's out there. You can find that, and you can watch him do it. And what it looks like, if you just look at the experiment, that the, that the guy who's trying to make the pH go up or down, he's just sitting there staring at the beaker of water. You know? So it's like the, uh, 
you know, you don't see much. There isn't much to tell what's going on. But what's going on is that the pH of water isn't a constant. The pH of water, if you could measure it at a thousand different places in that beaker, you know, it's just a normal beaker, maybe a two cup beaker. And if you could measure it a thousand different spots in that beaker and you could measure it instantaneously, you'd see the pH was going all over the place, right? So what you'd have is a is a pH on the y-axis and the x-axis would be time. You'd have something, you know, going up and down like like this as it moved across because at any instant in time, you have, um, you know, OH ions, OH minus ions coming apart. Now you have H plus ions, you know, well, H plus is a little acid ion, you know, the H minus are the, uh, you know, the base ions. And these things combine, recombine, you know, in water all the time. So you have this molecular process that's going on. And the result that somebody measures when they stick a piece of litmus paper or stick some kind of tool in it is a kind of an average, you know, because they get a reading over two or three seconds, and then they they look at the kind of the average reading. So they're just looking at the average of the pH at any particular time, because there's tens of thousands, if not millions, of little OHs turning into Hs and Hs connecting with Os to turn into OHs. You see, so stuff is going. A, a, acid and base and all that's changing all the time in the water. Well, there's a certain probability there that things can change. That an, o, that an OH will come apart and give you an H plus, or that some of, you know, something will break down and, and modify between acid or base. So there's a certain probability of that. And what you're doing with your intent is shifting that probability. So you're changing the probability down at the molecular level, down at the atomic level, if you will. You're shifting the probability of what might happen inside that water at that time. And now you're making it, say, a little more likely that that process is going to produce H pluses rather than OH minuses. Because you've shifted the probability with your intent. All right, now you move it up from what's the, what's the, uh, the uh, basic of, of water that's neither acid or base. I think that's a 7, isn't it? Isn't yeah. the pH 7 neutral? Yeah, so you'd start with a 7, and you'd work your intent on that, and as you change that probability, it would go from a, from a 7, let's say, from a 7, and now the average level just went up from 7 to 7.01, but now you keep your intent Accumulate because now the seven, the seven point, you know, the seven point oh five. That's now the average. Now you're going to raise that. That average will go up. So over time, this pH will just gradually rise because you are keeping an intent on it that keeps the probability that more H pluses will be made than OH minuses, and the, the beaker gets more acid. But now you can't sit down. And say, so, all right, I want a beaker that's more acid, and in the next second, you have something that's, you know, pH 8. Right. You see, you can't do that because th that would create really massively something that was improbable happening to something that was probable. But in the margins, you can make those little changes. Right, a little bias up on the pH, and then a little more, a little bias, and a little bias. So all you have to do is change it by a minute amount a whole lot of times or over a very long time and it begins to build up to something that is very obvious when you measure the average with a piece of litmus paper or uh, you know with, with some other kind of a, of a measurement device. So that's what's going on. You're, you're really changing the probability at the atomic and molecular level of how water breaks down and recombines all the time to change that pH. And that's why you can make it go down as well as you can make it go up, because you can change the probability in either direction. So it's not like you're taking a big step. It's just you are using the natural, you know, the natural way that water works, and it's a probabilistic thing, and you're just putting a bias in the probabilities. 
and then you're holding that bias there long enough over time so that you have then a fairly big, say a whole unit of pH, goes from a 7 to an 8 measurement. Well, that's a huge measurement, right? That's a lot of, that's a lot of change in pH to go from a 7 to an 8. But you can't do it quickly. You have to do it in the margins. You have to do it where, where you're only changing the probability by a little bit. But that bias adds. So does that answer your question? That's kind of the mechanics of it. Yes, it, it, it does. Is it is it sort of like they're not really doing anything to the water? Like they're not using their focused intent to 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 use their mind to, to non-locally correlate with the water to make the water go up, but they're basically just like looking at the statistics and like you say, like the natural uncertainty and, and just sort of using their own bias to make it what they want to make it within the natural uncertainty of what it already is. Yes. See, the, yeah, exactly. You got it. That's what it is. It's that, that second one. So water could be, water fluctuates all the time. You know, like I say, if you could measure it precisely enough, it wouldn't be seven. It would be 0 0.695, 0 0.7, you know, oh, three, point, you know, and over an average, they'd average out to about 0.7. So water's fluctuating all the time. And what they're doing is just putting a bias in the probability of those fluctuations that then build. Yeah, they're not magically converting, you know, some of the water into acid or something like that. Yeah, it's not, that's kind of what it seems like. But that's not what they're doing. They're just putting a bias in the natural process that, that goes on statistically all the time. Right. Just like you said with the um with the hospital patients, you know, they had all the records yes. and then somebody could bias it uh, and you know to make it fit their their um their statistics to make the uh so like for instance, like let's I I use the metaphor like with basketball, like let's say, you know, most people would agree that Michael Jordan is the best basketball player, but somebody could kind of like modify the statistics to make another basketball player seem like he was the, you know, had maybe have film about it and you know, all that kind of stuff to modify to make, you know, Michael Jordan look, you know, not the best basketball player, but maybe, you know, Dominique Wilkins or you know, somebody else. Right. As long as you have enough natural uncertainty. You know, which like in the pH, the uncertainty is, well, what is the pH of that water anyway? Well, it's uncertain. We really don't know, you know, because a measurement of pH is just an average. You know, that right. water is actually changing all over the place. So what is the pH of that water? Well, nobody really knows. It's uncertain. Well, within that uncertainty, I can change it. So if there's a certain amount of uncertainty about well, who's the best basketball player, well, you can use intent to modify that uncertainty. Right. You see, that's the that's the way it works. But you got to start with the natural uncertainty. Yeah, it's not. This is not a change the water into wine thing. You know, this is uh, this is taking the the uh, the natural uncertainty of pH and biasing it to do something a little different. Because it could be, you know, it could be a point seven zero two. Yeah, you know, that happens some. You know, you may stick a, you know, if you had a really good measurement that down to two or three decimal places of pH, you may stick it in that water a hundred times, you'd get a hundred different measurements, right? Because it's actually changing all the time. It's a dynamic thing. Right. Well, there's uncertainty there, and that's what you can bias to run that up. So that's how that experiment, that's how that experiment works, because there's enough natural uncertainty in what the pH is that you can work with that. Right, exactly. If there was none, you see, if this idea that, oh, water has a pH of 7, period, flat, that means it's 0 0.7 point, you know, with 20 zeros after it all the time everywhere, then there's no uncertainty. Then you right. can't work with that. You can sit and you can use your mind to, to do that, and there's nothing going to happen because you don't have any uncertainty to work with. This is a matter of, of kind of working the system because it's a probabilistic system. You see, it's why, it's why we can do these things with our mind. That's why the placebo effect works. It's the same thing with health, with healing. Somebody has a, now an intent that they're going to get better. Well, that starts changing the probability in, you know, as far as the, the cells and the, the atoms and the, you know, working at, the, at that level, things start to change to meet that change in, in the probability. But it's only because there's a lot of uncertainty to work with that 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 works yeah, exactly. yeah it's not magic it's physics <laughs> right right yeah thank you so much yeah, thank you're you. welcome